Good afternoon, morning, evening, whatever time it happens to be for you. My name is George Paris. And I, in my later years here, I've become interested in history, history of science, history of politics, history of uh, war, etc. A variety of interest. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the, the different aspects of that. One of the things which I have come to appreciate is trying to put the actual events that we read about, we hear about, into a context that helps make sense of the, what individual people are saying and doing, okay? Uh, I don't think that without that context, uh, this history doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And contrarily or, or uh, supplementarily, uh, if you understand the context, you can often sort of predict and understand why people are doing what they're doing. Okay, uh, if you just if you have a very narrow picture of a person or a event and don't know the context, it's uh, I think it's very easy to get misled, and that's sort of where I come into this. Now, <clears throat> let's go here. Uh, one of the issues that have come up, it turns out that I am a Southerner. You can tell that from the, my voice and whatnot. And over the years, uh, I've become the owner or access to very family doc, very various family documents and stuff. And I find that the image that is being presented of the South today, and as a matter of fact, since I was a child in my schooling and whatnot, uh, is not consistent with what I understood my family to be and do. And so I started looking back at this a while. And it, a lot of it circles around Abraham Lincoln. And I found, if you asked me to rate all the presidents of the United States, I would have to put Abraham Lincoln at the bottom. Why? Very simply, he caused and pursued a war. We call it the Civil War. That's what the history books like to call it, that uh, killed thousands of people, uh, basically had almost genocidal impact on what I would call the South, the, the, what was at that time the cons Confederacy. And I mean, how do you how do you do that and, and come out of the history books looking like a gym? OK, and the way they do that, of course, is they make the Confederacy look like a bunch of mangy dogs who only live to enslave people and then you turn Lincoln into the great emancipator who saves all the black people and basically restores the Union along the way which uh, I'm about to try to attack that one as well so here we go Okay, let's give a little introduction. I strongly believe that his, I'm a, by the way, I'm going to read a lot of this, have a lot of text in this, and you can use the text to go back and look at the individual slides carefully if you wish. It's a long series of videos. I've actually broken it into several parts. But <clears throat> I'll end up reading <clears throat> a lot of the material just because it's my words. In any event, as an introduction to this, I believe strongly that history is best understood by reading, where possible, the primary documents. The, that's the primary documents that drove history forward. Frankly, textbooks, biographies, movies based on history, and other representations of history not only obscure the truth, in many cases they deliberately obscure the truth. Deliberately obscure the truth. They may drop to the status of nothing more than political propaganda in many cases. And I would I would throw most of your American history textbooks used in high school and college right into that pile. Now, because my family history, which includes wounded Confederate veterans on both sides of my family tree, I became interested in examining the events that shaped my families in North Carolina before, during, and after the war that raged between 1861 and 1865. I have a problem with the term Civil War, but uh, I'll probably use it from time to time, as did people on both sides of the, of the conflict. Although I was raised and educated entirely in rural North Carolina, 
I discovered that I had been indoctrinated with a consistent northern view of events. We used to sing John Brown's body and stuff like that in in my uh, class. And, you know, like I remember fourth grade, we did a lot of singing. That was, you know, Battle Hymn of the Republic and John Brown's body and all I love us stuff. So <clears throat> I think that uh, that's not what you would expect a southern leaning pe bunch of people to be singing. Anyway, a lot of this <clears throat> is going to circle around Abraham Lincoln. I really think that a lot of the distortions of history have been created to make this person look like a great uh, president. It has become, my opinion, much of the information taught to, to recent generations has been the result of generations of historians attempting to preserve the Lincoln image as the great emancipator. When in fact, Lincoln was an uneducated man with all the biases and prejudices shared by all Europeans. He, of course, understood the Constitution in its letters. But like most people born west of the original colonies, he did not realize that the states are sovereign and independent. The federal government is merely an agreement among the states to facilitate commerce and provide mutual defense. If you don't believe me, go back and read Madison's notes. Uh, very few people read Madison's notes. It is a th authoritative example of what happened in the creation of the American Constitution, the, the U.S.'s Constitution. And so if you don't believe what I'm saying, go back and read that, please. All right. <clears throat> Indeed, the body of the Constitution is merely an operating agreement among the states. That is, if you look at the various articles of the Constitution, that's all it does. It sets up a way these different states were intended to interact and provide a mutual government that they could all uh, that would facilitate commerce and mutual defense. When it was sent out for ratification, the people in every state were appalled that the personal freedoms that they had fought for and won in the War of Independence were not incorporated. You look at the, the body of the Constitution, doesn't say anything about your rights, privileges, etc. It just talks about how the government's supposed to work. Okay, <clears throat> these were the rights given by God, not by any government, not by the state government, not by the federal government, not by the British, etc. These were the, the rights given by God. This is, if you go back to the Declaration of Independence, you'll find that type of terminology. The states submitted various lists that were rights that were boiled down to a group of eight groups. And two more rights were included to ensure that the states and people would never be subjugated to the federal government. This is the Bill of Rights, which should have been called, um, should not have been called amendments. They were not changes to the Constitution. They were an addition to the Constitution. The amendments changed the operation agreement, but not the rights given by God. The amendments, if, if you look at the other amendments, if you go Amendment 11, et cetera, they change the operation agreement, but they don't change the rights given by God. And in that context, I don't think you could actually ever change the first 10 amendments. Moreover, Lincoln did not appreciate that the Constitution would go into effect only when nine of 13 states agreed to it. Okay, it's like you didn't have to have all 13 states did not have to agree to the, the Constitution for it to become law. The, the ones that wanted to be in it could be in it. The ones that didn't want to be in it didn't have to be in it. Finally, Lincoln seems to have been totally unaware that states explicitly, that le excuse me, three states explicitly stated what all implicitly assumed when they ratified the Constitution. Okay, the two the two last uh, amendments, two like last items in the uh, Bill of Rights were the enumerated Constitution rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage other re retained by the people. And that was number nine. Number ten, the pe the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. The Constitution was essentially a uh, contract of adhesion. If you know, it was handed to the states and said, "You take it or leave it, sign it or not sign it." And in that context, 
if you don't specify it in the contract, it ain't there. The states can, anything that's not specifically laid out in the Constitution, you can, the states should prevail, just like an insurance contract. Okay, <clears throat> it turns out that Virginia, New York, and Rhode Island each included within their ratification documents as a ratification of the Constitution of 1787, the explicit right to leave the Union. Now, according to Virginia, I'll quote, this is a, you can find this online. Uh, we, this is the delegates of the people of Virginia, duly elected, da, 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 et cetera, et cetera. The important part comes down to the next paragraph, which I have bolded here. It says, do in the name and in the behalf of the people of Virginia, declare and make known that the powers granted under the Constitution, being derived from the people of the United States, may be resumed by them whenever the same shall, per, er, shall be perverted to their injury or oppression, and that every power not granted thereby remains with them and at their will, that therefore no right of any denomination can be canceled, abridged, restrained, or modified by the Congress, by the Senate or House of Representatives, acting in any capacity by the president or by the department offices of the United States, except in those instances in which power is given by the Constitution for those purposes, and that among those, among other essential rights, the liberty of conscience and of the press cannot be canceled, abridged, restrained, or modified by any authority of the United States. All right, and it, it goes on. Basically, Virginia saying, you know, we're signing this. We agree to the, in principle, to the way we work. But if this thing becomes problematic for us, if we feel that, that it's being perverted, we are reserving the right to leave. Now, every all the states assume that. It was implicit in their joining. But Virginia, New York, and Rhode Island made some explicit statements. <clears throat> New York said something very similar. I'll, re I'll quote the part that's bolded here. That the powers of government may be assumed by the people whensoever it shall become necessary to their happiness and that every power, jurisdiction, and right which is not by the said Constitution clearly de delegated to the Congress of the United States or the departments of the government therefore remain to the people of the several states or to their respective governments to whom they may have granted the same. In other words, you know, we'll we'll do what we want to do if we if we think that the government is causing us problems here. Now, Rhode Island had something similar. I've got it at the bottom here. I notice that my uh, <coughs> my um, cameo is sort of blocking part of it, but if you can find it, you can read it. <coughs> Let's go to the next one. All right, now Lincoln's home was in Illinois, which became a state in 1818. This was like, what, like 20, 30 years later, okay. He was the first president raised and educated west of the Eastern mountain ranges, that is say the Appalachians and Allegheny Mountains. And in 1840, the population was less than 500,000 but by 1860, the population was 1.7 million. This tripling of the population less than one generation occurred because of mass migration. This immigration did not come from Eastern states. It came directly from Europe. I will have more to say about Lincoln's ignorance of the general law and of the Constitution in particular as the items come up, but I want to move this want to move to this free and enslaved states, okay? Now, if you look at who was moving from Europe into the West, uh, if you look at the, this map carefully, it's, in, it's online, I, I borrowed it from someplace, you'll find that <clears throat> the vast majority of people in the upper Midwest, we Illinois, Wisconsin, so were Germans. And a lot of Irish had moved into 
the East Coast, particularly around New York. And then farther west, you had primarily, again, German ancestry. But the, the point I want to make here is that these people were coming from basically monarchical societies and they ended up moving directly onto federal lands. This was territories, federal territories that were not states at this time. And so they never had any appreciation for statehood. It was like they... They came directly from Europe with all their European ideas, and they dropped themselves into federal territories. They recognized the federal government. They never had any particular loyalty to states as independent. And so naturally, they were thinking in terms of the federal government being their government and the states as just administrative districts within the federal government. They did not appreciate with the people in the South. If you look down in the Southern part, you'll find that they're basically British or African-American. And the, the tradition in the Southeast was basically British that, hey, we had won the war against Britain to gain statehood, to take, uh, independence, and then the states formed the Union. That's not the way the new immigrants saw things. This is one of the problems I have with massive immigration from outside because people do not come in and do not understand and appreciate what the actual government that they're joining is. All right. Now, <clears throat> I'll read this. The immigrants to Illinois from Germany were mainly Protestant farmers escaping a Prussian monarchy. They had never seen an African until reaching North America. They were ex exceptionally motivated to own land and supported the free soil movement which movement meant that, that basically the free soil movement was meant to prevent Africans and Native Americans from occupying land that the Europeans wanted. All right. So you had the Europeans moving into the upper Midwest were looking for land. They wanted to be farmers and have their own land, which is something they couldn't have in Europe, which is much more crowded. And to do that, they wanted to make sure that the Native Americans and freed Africans did not take that land. We had a whole series of, of all these states in the upper Midwest, everything north of the Ohio River there, the Ohio, Illinois, uh, Illinois, et cetera. They all had a bunch of what we call black codes, which were very restrictive, basically said, you know, black people, whether free or slave, can't live here. They have to move through. They, you know, they are subject to arrest if they uh, try to, to uh, live here etc etc cetera, et cetera. so there's some very restrictive laws going on and i like to call these states the the african free slave free states not the free african states because they didn't they had no particular appreciation for african americans the point of the free soil movement was to not to free africans but rather to maintain the soil free of africans okay uh, Illinois Black Code, 1863, officially enact to prevent the immigration of free Negroes into the state. Prohibited any black persons from outside the state from staying in the state for more than 10 days. Subjecting black immigrants who remain beyond the 10 days to arrest, detention, a $50 fine, which was a lot of money in 1853, uh, potential debt labor for those who would not pay, for, or deportation. The Black Code was repealed early in 1865, the same year that the Civil War ended. Okay. Illinois, like most of the Western and Midwest, was a slave-free state, not a free slave state. Now, in this context, this is the context in which Lincoln was trying to get into politics. Okay. There was something, 1858, there was a Lincoln-Douglas debate. This is uh, uh, Stephen Douglas, and he was basically, this was a debate in Illinois trying to win over Illinois' voters. This was not a, a, a debate in South Carolina or Georgia or someplace with a bunch of Southerners. This was a bunch of Midwesterners. Okay. Now, I'm just, I've highlighted some statements here. 
this again, everything, all these these uh, primary documents are on the internet. You can go find them and read them yourself if you don't if you think I've corrupted it in some way. But this is Lincoln is at this point responding to comments that that Douglas had made. Among other things, I'm I'm, I'm just going to hit the the bolded stuff here. My first impulse, this is Lincoln speaking would be to free all the slaves and send them to Liberia, to their own native land. Now that's a theme which you will see through the entire Lincoln story. He's not in favor of slavery, but he's certainly not in favor of African Americans living in the United States. I'll drop down to the next bulleted section. What then, free them all and keep them among us as underlings? Is it quite certain that this betters their condition, okay? In other words, the, the issue of what do we do with the blacks comes up, and he's basically saying we could free them all and just keep them here as, as underlings. That would be a uh, white supremacist view of the world. Uh, he's you know, thinking his way through this problem, I guess. What next? Free them and make them politically and socially our equals? That's another alternative. My own feelings will not permit this, and if mine would, we well know that those of the great mass of white people will not. He's speaking in Illinois in 1858. He's not speaking in South Carolina. This is Lincoln's words, 1858, not, not Jefferson Davis in South Carolina, all right, or Mississippi. Okay, next state, what next? Free them and make them political, social articles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, we'll go down to the next one. We cannot then make them equals. It does seem to me that the system of gradual emancipation might be adopted, but for their tardiness in this, I will not undertake to judge our brethren in the South. Okay, he's saying, well, you know, the Southerners are still owning the slaves, but I'm not going to... Uh, cast stones at them because, hey, I do exactly the same thing. Dropping down to the bottom paragraph there, it says, but all this, to my judgment, furnishes no more excuse for permitting slavery to go into our own free territory than it would be for reviving Africa's slave trade by law. Okay. At this point, in 1807, I believe it was, international slave trade was outlawed. So the, the shipment of, of Africans from Africa to the islands of the Caribbean, that would be Hispaniola, Cuba, Jamaica, etc., was supposed to have stopped. It didn't. Now, by the way, I don't know if I've covered this. I'll, I'll see if, if I've got into it. Okay, I, I basically have gone back here and pulled out those specific items that I've, I've quoted to you. Uh, and the, the words in red are the words Lincoln said. And basically, in his response to Douglas, Lincoln favors repatriation of Africa's, but he sees it as impractical, but an idea he never abandons. This We'll see this again in 1862. What then? Free them all, etc. Well, while Lincoln does not incline to be a slaveholder, he is not inclined to view Africans as equals. Basically, Lincoln is clearly a racist and a white supremacist. These were views that were common among all Europeans, northern and southern, right? with perhaps a few abolitionists along the way in northeast. But clearly in the Midwest, people were not, they were racist and they were white supremacists, and as was Lincoln. Now, what next? Free them, but up. Lincoln explicitly states he does not consider Africans to be as equal, and the knowledge that white supremacy is universal north and south. All right, so you know, keep those things in your mind. Why is white supremacy universal among Europeans? All right, there's both a common knowledge and an emerging scientific basis for the notion of white supremacy in the 1850s. Let's go, this, I'm going back in the context here. Europeans literally discovered the earth and the people and animals own it in the period of say 1400 to 1800s. 
Now, with regard to sub-Saharan Africans, the Europeans found little that they regarded as civilization. No horses, no agriculture, no manufacturing, no written language, no schools, no mathematics, few organized permanent cities. And the societies, Europeans' encounters were mostly tribal and virtually naked and frequently do dominated by Muslims who were clearly responsible for most of the organization that existed. In other words, Muslims from the, from the Mideast had penetrated into Southern Africa where they were enslaving black people and deporting them back to the Mideast. Now it turns out there's not a big genetic footprint of that because the males that were taken back uh, were castrated. That was sort of the, the Muslim idea of how do you deal with that. And so under Islam, you can't, uh, you can't uh, hold other uh, Muslims as slaves. And so a lot of the black Africans who were leading these tribes, et cetera, had adopted the uh, Islam as a religion, and they were basically acting as operatives for the Muslims. All right. All right. <clears throat> now, in addition, look, keep in mind, you have to appreciate the, the, scientific context and what people understood. When people from Europe discovered Sub-Saharan Africa, these are mainly Portuguese, some uh, Spanish, etc., <clears throat> and ultimately some British, etc., they simultaneously enc encountered a bunch of other primates in Central Africa. They found uh, chimpanzees, they found gorillas, these are obviously primates, and they're obviously not human. So the question comes up is, are these Africans really human or not? And so this was a, believe it or not, you need to go back and read all this. These were hotly debated topics in the 1800s among the scientific elite in all the big universities in Europe and in the United States. Okay, And the idea is that they propagated from these universities amongst the highly educated elites were so sorted down to the general population. Now, <clears throat> let's go forward here. Now, there had been a religious view for a long time. In the long-held view of creation, God had created all the animals and mankind. God had given mankind dominion over the earth and the animals. The creation was perfect and did not change. And all the animals of Africa thus were under the dominion of mankind. But there was a biological awakening in science. And hint, by the way, it did not help the situation of Africans. All right. <clears throat> Going back into the scientific context here, biology was beginning to challenge the long-held view of creation. 1844, a fellow by the name of Robert Cham Chambers published something what's called the Vestiges of Natural History of Creation. There was very little experimental support for this document, which was published anonymously because of its controversial nature, that is controversial relative to religion. But it clearly interpreted the observable universe, physical and biological, as a result of evolution. The, the figure here is, is actually a figure that came out of that document. But the mechanism of that evolution was not understood or explained. There was no, how do, how do things evolve? That was not understood. People have been talking about evolution for a long time. Back in the 1700s, uh, it had come up, people were discussing that you know, thing there, there obviously was some uh, physiological or a anatomical relationship among species and, and organisms, and it appeared that you could assume that these had all branched off from some main line, but it was not understood how that could happen. There was a fellow by the name of Alfred Russell Wallace, 1823 to 1913. That overlaps my grandparents. And Charles Darwin, 1809 to 1882. These folks became extremely important in the mid-1800s. Notice the timing of these events. 
Now, Charles Darwin was a wealthy British aristocrat and pondered the question of evolution. The idea of evolution was clearly not unique to Darwin without a mechanism. Evolution was merely a speculative concept that flew in the face of Christian doctrine. Thus, Darwin was disinclined to publish his ideas and merely collected data for a long time. Now, Wallace, on the other side of a, of a street or railroad tracks or whatever, Wallace was a poor man. He made his living scouring the jungles and remote places of Earth for interesting insects and other organisms that he could sell to wealthy European collectors. Wallace lacked Darwin's religious and social inhibitions. He had nothing to lose. He's a poor guy. He's got no money. He's out there scraping for a li living. You'll find this, you know, depending upon whether you were raised in wealth or raised in poverty, you'll find this sort of demarcation. Um, anyway, so Wallace lacked Darwin's religious and social inhibitions. And while he was recovering from fever in the Malay archipelago, 1854 to 1862, he hit upon an idea that natural selection would cause evolution of biological species. In other words, whatever the fittest species was, or the fittest members of a species was, they would survive, the less fit ones would die off. Now this idea had been sort of introduced by Adam Smith, an inquiry into the nature and cause of wealth of nations, 1776. It had, uh, Smith had introduced it as an economic theory of why some nations were rich, some nations were poor. Okay. Wallace wrote up his idea and sent it to Darwin for review. I've got some fellows in here. Darwin <clears throat> viewed Wallace's paper as an abstract of his own work. And this was, of course, shocking to, to Darwin. Darwin had wanted to publish his work, but he had not done it because he didn't want to uh, potentially alienate his, his uh, uh, peers and whatnot, religious and, and social spirit, peers. And so here comes Wallace, who had met Darwin and communicated with him before, with this idea, which clearly summarized what, what Darwin was trying to, to pr pursue. And so this put Wallace in a, excuse me, Darwin in a real precarious uh, ethical position in that, you know, if he just let it go, then Wallace would get credit for his, his idea of uh, survival of the fittest, whereas uh, Darwin wanted to take credit for that, worked out with a few of his, his buddies there. Remember, remember, Wallace is in Malay, uh, and he's out there still sick, and Darwin's back in England where all the, the decisions are made and all the ideas get circulated. So Darwin <clears throat> had a few of his friends read these two papers, his notes that he'd shared with some of his close friends, and the uh, paper by Wallace at a scientific meeting, and because Darwin's was read first, Darwin got the, the lion's share of the credit for this idea of natural selection. Now, it's very important what Darwin's type. Now, Darwin immediately got to work and wrote, took all of his data, put it in a big book, self-published it. He was rich, so he could self-publish this book. It was not peer-reviewed. It was self-published, and it went out and had a very big impact on the population. Now, we normally hear that book being called Origin of the Species. It wasn't called Origin of the Species. Here's the title of it. Was on the origin of species by means of natural selection or, and this becomes an important concept, the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. That was published in 1859. All right. This was brand new, highly controversial, very widely distributed, very important ideas that exploded in 1859. The idea that speciation was the result of preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. All right. So Darwin clearly accepted the notion of racism. Now, 
if you look, this is actually, this particular drawing I, I got straight out of the internet someplace. This was typical of what you see in many modern textbooks. You know, you see this progression from chimpanzees, gorillas, etc., to modern humans. You'll notice that they get lighter, more white, as you go from left to right in this picture. Less hairy and more white. And uh, you can assume that if Africans are in this picture, they must be somewhere between that white guy on the right, that European, and the uh, guy to his left, which presumably is not human. So the, the Africans may or may not be human in the view of people in the mid-1800s. Now, it's my humble opinion that Wallace and Darwin were correct that natural solution causes evolution, but they were wrong to extrapolate the idea of evolution causing speciation. I've published papers saying exactly the reverse. Uh, speciation, I believe, is a unique event having to do with fairly massive mutations in the, the, the genome and which prevents uh, interbreeding within people who have the same an anatomy, basically the same anatomy, they just can't interbreed. And as a result, you get a new species formed, and that species then is free to evolve because you're not being constantly mixed back into the, the general population. But you need to uh, look up some of my documentation and read some of the papers I've written. Uh, I, my, my, for it, for, uh, for clarity, my view is a minority view. People still think that evolution causes speciation, but I, I disagree entirely. I think speciation allows evolution. All right, let's go forward here. <clears throat> Not surprisingly, the views of Darwin exploded in 1859 with the publication of Origin of the Species. Darwin's ideas spread around the world and many naturalists in Europe and North America realized that it, its success implied that there was a ranking of the races. Some must be more primitive than others. This idea created a new field of pseudoscientific research. I, I emphasize the idea that there must be a, 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 a sequence of races of better races and lesser races, uh, created scientific research in the mid-1800s, which is really sort of a pseudoscience. And it, go, it really goes back to the Darwin idea that evolution causes speciation. If you reverse that, speciation allows evolution. You realize that all the races are equal. Important idea, by the way, which I think biology actually supports, I support, etc. We just, we're all one species and we just happen to have evolved into different ecological niches but we can still interbreed and when we do it's all going to get mixed up it's all you know we're going to come out with more combinations etc uh <clears throat> all right darwin's ideas spread around the world etc uh naturalists started measuring the volume of skulls this was one of the things that they like to do this was capable because Museums had collections of skulls that people had picked up various places. This effort was easily directed to any popular result because the sampling of skulls was very, very small and could be easily manipulated. And the scientific conclusions that dominated the universities of Europe and North America and most respected authorities was that Europeans were the most evolved and Africans were less evolved. One of the well-known and uh, well-informed po politicians in the United States that learned this fact was Alexander H. Stevens, whom we will meet in 1861. You don't, you probably don't know who Alexander H. Stevens is, but he obviously managed to get his hands on uh, some lecture notes or maybe attended a lecture about this particular topic. But he was certainly not alone. There's, this was a unified widely accepted idea that there were a gradation of races with Europeans at the top. <clears throat> now, it turns out, going back to this measuring of the size of the brains, etc., uh, 
this this goes into millions of years ago and the size of the brain. We have it in the last 10,000 years. It's been almost no change in any any Homo sapien brain. Okay, that basically I'm saying that although there is a pattern, if you go back in millions of years and different species within the species we think of as Homo sapiens, that would be us and the Chinese and the Africans and everybody that we view as humans today. Uh, there's been no no discernible difference. <clears throat> All right, let's go back to Lincoln a bit. As you know, Lincoln was elected president in 1860. If you look at this map, the electoral map, what really happened here? Lincoln was not any great universally beloved person. He just happened to have the right combination of electoral states. He ended up with an electoral college win, but he only had like 40% of the popular vote. The Democratic Party split three ways. And if any one of those three guys had dropped out, Lincoln probably would not have won the election. So he was actually a minority president, and a lot of people resented that from the get-go, regardless of what his political views, et cetera, were. Now, he was actually, at this point, teamed up with, uh, he became a Republican. Republicans were other uh, other groups that were in the Republican Party were abolitionists. So Lincoln was viewed as an abolitionist, uh, and he was also viewed as not a particularly popular guy and uh, certainly didn't have a popular majority. <clears throat> now, South Carolina, almost immediately after the election of 1860, seceded <clears throat> from the Union. And you may say, why? Why South Carolina? Why not Virginia or Tennessee or Florida or whatever? Why did South Carolina secede? Well, you really have to go back to 1830. And this is a grievance that actually began in 1830. And it has to do with how we were taxed at that point. In 1830 and up and up to 1830, federal taxes were based on tariffs collected at the points of imports from overseas. The southern states, with the exception of Virginia and North Carolina, manufactured almost nothing and had had to import almost everything. Okay. They even imported cotton goods from New England and Europe. Okay. So they were paying most of the federal taxes. If you looked at Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, Kentucky, and East Texas and Arkansas, these states were paying most of the federal tax because it was based on imports. And what ha had started out as a revenue device, in other words, how are we going to raise revenue to support the federal government? had become a, what was viewed at this point, a protective tariff. In other words, they were raising revenue that they didn't need to raise, and it was being raised to protect the industry that had developed in New England. New England had abundant water power and cotton mills and shipbuilding and all that type of industry had evolved in New England because you had a, a, the fall line, the place where water power, where the water fell from a high level to a low level, was right at the coast. And so you could have your manufacturing and your shipping very close together. Places like Providence, Rhode Island, uh, Connecticut, Boston, etc. There's a great elevation change. And these rivers, you could create a, a water wheel situation to drive your factories and you could have manufacturing. In the South, the fall line runs through Richmond, Virginia. It runs through Raleigh, North Carolina. It runs through uh, Athens, Georgia. It, or, uh, it, uh, it, it ends up someplace in the middle of Alabama. You'll notice basically what happens here is that the fall line is far. First off, the fall line is not as, not as distinct in these areas. You, instead of having 100 feet of water falling, you have five feet of water falling. 
and it's far from the coast. You can't get, you know, you have to, if you're going to have manufacturing in places like Columbus, Georgia, or, or uh, uh, Athens, Georgia, or, or um, uh, Columbia, South Carolina, you're basically still 100 miles from, from the nearest harbor. And so it's not very convenient to do that. The South was basically forced to be not a manufacturing area, it had to be an agricultural area. And so by raising the, the tariffs uh, unnecessarily high, the federal government could protect the industries in the Northeast, allow them to have great profits, and so that the South had to buy the cheapest thing they could get would be from the Northeast, whereas they could actually buy things cheaper from Europe. If it was not for the tariff, they would buy from England or France, but because the tariff was there, they'd end up buying from the Northeast. And the South greatly res resented that. And in particular, this became an actual financial burden, and primarily for South Carolina. Why would, why would South Carolina uniquely be problematic in 1830 relative to, say, Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi? Well, the simple fact is that the Native Americans had been moved out. 1830s, the Native Americans were moved out from the North Georgia, North Alabama, Mississippi area towards Oklahoma. And so those states had recently, in the 18, I think, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, we start to talk about uh, statehood and whatnot. In the 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18 20 time frame, the, North, the Native Americans were moved out 1830. North Georgia became available for, for cropping, uh, you know, plantation type uh, organization. And so those states, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, East Texas, Arkansas, et cetera, were doing pretty well economically in 1830. South Carolina, on the other hand, was not doing well. One of the things you, you, you need to understand behind all this economics is that in these days, the 1800s, mid 1800s, up till about 1875, artificial um, uh, uh, fertilization was not available. You didn't have mineral fertilizers that you could go spread on your soil. South Carolina had been a colony and a state for a long time and had been cropping its land for a long time. Basically, the soils in South Carolina were worn out such that the, the ability to produce crops, especially cotton, was not, uh, not very good. You couldn't get a very good yield there. Whereas Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi in 1830 had brand new lands that were newly opened. Uh, the, the Native Americans who were moved out had not been farming intensely, uh, at least not nearly on the scale that the uh, Europeans were in, say, uh, South Carolina and eastern North Carolina and Virginia. And so the unique thing about South Carolina in 1830 was the fact that they were uh, economically stressed much more by this this uh, tax than anybody else. So when the, the taxes came into play, South Carolina felt very strongly that it had to do something about it. And a concept that had been floated early in the game uh, was something called nullification. You know, could, could a state say that federal law was null within the state? This turned out to be uh, a, a false idea, primarily because you're trying to have it both ways. If you're going to say the law will not be applied here in the state, but we're going to be still be part of the union and we're going to enjoy the umbrella of the union that's that's try to have your cake and eat it too all right so nullification was not uh, uh, secession it was just saying we're not going to follow that law here well it turns out andrew jackson was the president andrew jackson was a badass sob uh, he actually had a pistol ball in his chest that he got in a fight in which he killed the the other guy he had led 
the U.S. armies against the British. He led them against the Native Americans, uh, and he was a guy you do not mess with. He was actually from uh, the border between South Carolina and North Carolina. North Carolina claims him. South Carolina probably has an equal claim. But in any event, Andrew Jackson was a very, a guy you do not mess with. When he said he was going to enforce his laws, he was going to enforce his laws. And you knew it. But at the same time, he was not a fool. He was, uh, he believed in the Constitution. And he went to the Congress and he got something called the Force Bill passed through Congress. And the Force Bill basically said that he had the right to, using the Force Bill, he was going to use the Force Bill to enforce that law in South Carolina. And he was basically supported by all the other states, most of the other southern states that were not impacted as heavily as South Carolina. But a compromise was reached. There was a mitigation of the tariff and the uh, basically uh, South Carolina actually nullified the force bill for symbolic reasons. But basically they reversed their strand because they were they were fairly certain that that uh, uh, Andrew Jackson would uh, bring hell to pay uh, in South Carolina if they kept that up. Anyway, let's go forward. In 1860, and we don't hear about this much, in 1860, Congress again raised the tariff. There had also been a series of violent abolitionist actions, such as attempt by John Brown to seize and hold, contrary to Northern history, it was not a mere raid, on the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. The reason for this raid was to arm and initiate a general revolt of slaves against the owners in the South. Okay, you keep hearing about John Brown's raid. It's like he rode through one day, shot up the place and left. No, that's not what he was intending to do. John Brown, he seized a federal arsenal because that's where the guns were and that's where the guns could be made. And the whole idea was to seize it and hold it. And he was financed by a number of, of Northern abolitionists, well, well known. If you go read the history, you'll find out that it was a well known fact that he was financed by a number of Northern abolitionists to, to seize and hold that and create a sla general slave revolt throughout the South, which would have ended up in the slaughter of many Southern, many white Southerners, and that necessarily there would have been a lot of black Southerners killed as well. He was surprised and he was, he was really unexpected because guess what? The slaves were not so upset that they wanted to come and join the revolution. And a fellow by the name of Robert E. Lee was in the federal army and he was called out to put down that. And he in fact did. And so John Brown was clearly a militant abolitionist and uh, was clearly trying to start a slave revolt and he failed. Now, slave revolts in places like Haiti had been bloody and nasty in the early 1800s. And so the idea of a slave revolt in the south of the United States would have concerned the white population tremendously. Because for the, in many places out in the rural areas, there were more blacks than whites. And so, you know, that would have been a, a potential real problem. That there, there have been slave revolts in the United States. Uh, I don't talk about them. I, I wrote a book called Annabella, and it's discussed in one of those volumes. I forget which one. But <clears throat> in any event, there had been slave revolts in the United States, and they were universally uh, not happy situations. Okay, by 1860, cotton production and the depleted soils across the South was everywhere. By 1860, we've gone another 30 years. We're only one generation away. It's like the parents had seen nullification, but now they saw not only nullification, but they were looking at secession. And so to, to think that the people in 1860 did not have any contact to the, what happened in 1830 is ridiculous. It's a continuation of the same phenomenon. The 1830 merely was a aborted attempt at 1860. It was a, an attempt 
to, to do both stay in the union and avoid the ta tariffs. But in 1860, we had found out that you couldn't do that. You had to get out of the union. And it affected not just South Carolina, though South Carolina, again, was the most impacted state. But the other states, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, East Texas, Arkansas, Tennessee, etc., cetera, were, were similarly impacted, though not as drastically impacted as the first seven. The first seven states to, to leave were uh, South Carolina, uh, Texas, Florida, Mississippi, uh, Alabama, and Georgia. I think I got those right. <clears throat> At this time, they formed the Confederacy. North Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee, and Arkansas were still in the Union. This is something your, your history books generally do not point out. Okay, so the original Confederacy was, I think, seven states, and it was the Deep South, and it did not involve North Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee, Arkansas, Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware. None of those states were involved, although they all had slaves, and uh, as did uh, Missouri, and they all were still in the Union because they were not hurt as bad as the southern states by the tariffs. They had they had some manufacturing, and they had what had happened actually in North Carolina, Virginia, was when Georgia, uh, Alabama, and Mississippi had suddenly had lots of land. They needed lots of labor, and so a lot of slaves, which were becoming obsolete. The idea of slavery was becoming uneconomical in the East. They sold many of those slaves into the Southeast. It was like you were sold down the river, down the Ohio and Mississippi River into Louisiana, Mississippi, and uh, Alabama and Georgia. Slaves did not like that. And as a matter of fact, the, the white owners of those slaves in the Northeast, and the Northeast of the South, that would be the Upper South, did not care to break up those families either, but there was no labor for them in the East because the land was all occupied. Virginia and North Carolina didn't have open land, and the land that was there was not being very productive, and Virginia and North Carolina were able to have some manufacturing because of the position of the fault line, the way the rivers ran uh, in uh, Richmond and in Raleigh, you had some manufacturing. And so in the east of that, you had a good port in Wilmington and a good port, port in Richmond. So that those states were not nearly as affected as were the southern, the deep south states. <clears throat> so in 1860, all the, all the cotton states were in financial trouble, whereas in 1830, only uh, South Carolina had been in deep trouble. Now, at this time, the southern states basically said, hey, look, we are going to essentially withdraw from the Union. And because South uh, Virginia and, and, Rich, and uh, uh, Rhode Island and uh, New York had already put into their documents this, everybody had assumed the same thing because nobody objected to the ratification by these other states. And it was just, it was assumed that, I mean, if you looked at the uh, the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution. It basically says, hey, if it's not in the Constitution, the states are going to do what they want to do. And so there's nothing in the Constitution that says you can't leave. There's ways to increase states, but there's nothing that says you can't leave. And so uh, at this point, the, the cotton states were said, well, let's just leave. That way we don't have to pay these tariffs and originally you know the thought among the intellectual types even abolitions in the north was like okay well just let them go go in peace but in actual fact they suddenly started thinking hey there's going to be several problems here one is we're, not, we're going to have to change our tax structure and we're not going to have their their taxes to, to support the federal government and and basically to support northern interest 
uh, there's a whole, I don't have time to go into the whole thing, but we could spend hours talking about what would have happened had the South been allowed to lose, to leave. It would have been to their great advantage, ultimately. Now, this is where Lincoln's historical ignorance of the history of the Constitution came to play. And his belief in the perfection of the Union led him to make illegal and dictatorial decisions. The abolitionists and financial money men in the North were initially disinterested in the secession. However, as soon as it was realized that without Southern taxes, the economic aspirations of the North would be frustrated. They were happy to stand aside and let Lincoln force the Confederacy back into the Union. So exactly what did the Northern moneymen have to lose? The big prize in 1861 was the Transcontinental Railroad, TCRR. This road was going to benefit the Northeast and Upper Midwest states. The plan decided by Congress was to pay for it, that is the Transcontinental, by giving away federal lands along the right-of-way. But wait, if the Confederate states separated peacefully from the Union, they would expect a fair share of the federal territories, right? Those federal territories belong to everybody. And so the Southern states had a claim on federal territories if they were allowed to separate peacefully. Now, you, you got to appreciate that the South, the original Confederacy did not want a war with the USA. The CSA did not want a war with the USA. For starters, the CSA had no military power. They had no Navy. Okay. They had no, the, the organized army was out of Washington, D.C. There were militias in the South, but not an organized uh, Confederate army. So if you go back <clears throat> As early as February 27, 1861, this is a letter that uh, Jefferson Davis, who was elected president of the Confederacy, sent to Abraham Lincoln, or sent to, I probably sent it to Buchanan at that point, but it clearly expresses his desire for a peaceful resolution here. It says the president of the United States and being animated by an earnest desire to unite and bind together our respective countries by friendly ties. I have appointed Mr. M.J. Crawford da, 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 to the government of, he's basically sending an emissary to the government of the United States. For the purpose of establishing friendly relations between the Confederate States and the United States and, repo, and reposing special trust, etc. So, so basically, if you read this document, Jefferson Davis and the, and the Confederate Congress are basically asking for a peaceful separation. They want to establish peaceful relations. There was never any desire in the South to conquer Northern land or to depose the United States. They just wanted out. And certainly the original Confederate government in the, in the spring and early summer of 1861, had no military capability of doing that. They, re, they realized that they were a very small population, etc. They just wanted out of the federal government to get the federal taxes off of them and also to isolate themselves from the abolitionists who seemed to be working very hard to cause serious damage in the South. If you read down through this document, I've highlighted some stuff. <clears throat> now, basically, the, the commission that was sent by Jefferson Davis to Washington uh, was to meet with the authorities and with them to agree, treat, consult, negotiate of and concerning all matters and subjects of interest to both nations and to conclude and sign a treaty or treaties, conventions, etc., convention or conventions, touching uh, on all these issues. And that would have included things like federal forts and federal armories and federal whatever, the post office, etc., that were physically in the South and in the North. 
it would have made, for example, you had forts like Fort Sumter in the South. That was a federal fort. But if South Carolina was out of the Union, why would the federal government need a fort in Charleston Harbor? Just like why would South Carolina need a fort in New York Harbor? So the idea would have been, okay, let's agree that those buildings, et cetera, that are in the South go with the Southern states. The ones in the Northern states go with the Northern states. That actually would have been financially, if you sat down and added up all the money involved, the North would have won that. I mean, they, they, there's a lot more federal infrastructure in the North than in the South. One of the many things uh, that had been a burr in the South had been internal improvements, which had been basically supported by federal taxes and tended to go to the northern states. Anything on the Ohio River, for example, touched a number of states and was easily argued to be a federal project. Whereas if you had a, a project on the Neuse River or the Cape Fear River or the Chattahoochee River or wherever, didn't flow through a bunch of states and it was clearly a state problem. So the, so the places like Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania benefited from the federal uh, money going to a, a federal project. Anything having to do with the Great Lakes, et cetera, was pretty much a federal project. Whereas anything going through the South ended up being a state problem. It's like federal money is not going to support you cleaning up your river uh, running through Georgia. Okay, it's a state problem. And the state and the South accepted that idea. They realized that when they accepted their statehood and accepted their independence and their sovereignty, they were responsible for things that happened in their state. So anyway, <clears throat> clearly, if you go back, I mean, mo you, you never hear about this in the, in the history books. You never hear that the South, starting from the beginning of the Confederacy, was looking for a peaceful separation from the, the United States. You never hear that Jefferson Davis was working, sending people to the North to try to work these problems out. That there was never any interest in the South in taking land from the North, nor was there interest in destroying the federal government in the North. It was predictable and in fact happened that almost all the war happened in the South. There were a couple of incursions into Pennsylvania and Maryland, and uh, there was one in Indiana, I believe, which uh, were, they were not attempts to capture land. They were attempts to create a battle, create, bring out the Union forces to, to a decisive battle. Gettysburg was supposed to be that, unfortunately, for the South. Gettysburg was a great defeat. In the meantime, the, the North was already contemplating and formulating a plan to capture the South. Places like Fort Monroe, Virginia, the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Uh, there was uh, federal forts in uh, Florida, uh, probably in uh, Georgia and Mississippi as well were all targets of federal uh, uh, exploiting and militarily. And we'll go through that a bit. All right, <clears throat> so exactly what did the Northern Money Men have to lose? They had to lose a lot of tax and everything else that drove it along the way. Had the uh, South actually succeeded in uh, this uh, leading the Union peacefully, uh, there would have been just uh, a number of, of financial shocks in the North. Now, you remember this Alexander H. Stevens guy I talked about? <clears throat> he was an educated man and a Southern politician. Now, he uh, gave a speech. Uh, it was in uh, 1861. Uh, I guess it was 21 March 1861, shortly after the the Confederate Constitution had been written. The, Fe the, Fe the Southern Constitution, the Confederate Constitution, was very closely aligned with the Federal Constitution for very good reasons. Southerners that helped write 
the document. I mean, why not? So they, they basically, they were happy with most of the document. The things that they didn't, the reason they were seceding was there were things that were going on they didn't like. And when you, when the Charles, when uh, Stevens addressed, he's the vice president of the Confederate States. And when he is addressing people in Charleston, South Carolina, as to what the, the new constitution of the South has, you would think that the first thing he would mention would be the biggest problem that was driving them apart. And so his speech starts off with, I think, what was really the big driver, the reason for secession. And I'll, I'll try to quote this here. If you could read this document, go down to the bottom of this page here and uh, You've, there's a lot of introductory uh, verbiage there. And then the stuff I've highlighted says, this subject came well nigh causing the rupture of the old union under the lead of the Gallant Palmetto State. In other words, this was, he's going back to the 1833. It says, which lies on our border. In 1833, this old thorn and tariff, thorn of the tariff, which was the cause of so much irritation in the old body politic is removed forever from the new, basically from the new constitution. Basically, the, the, the tariff was the first thing that, that Alexander Stevens mentioned in this speech in which he's telling the population what the new constitution of the Confederacy has. And he's saying it's the we have taken the tariff out. We are not going to be financing this thing with the tariff. And that should be ver that should this should be the tariff speech, but it's not called a tariff speech. It's called a cornerstone speech. And why is it called a cornerstone speech? <clears throat> I I. I I've already discussed most of this. Basically, it's, it has to do with how things were financed. <clears throat> he goes on, having dealt with the important stuff, the tariff, Stevens moved on to lower priority items delivered on, eight, on the 21st of March, 1861 in Savannah, Georgia. Another feature which I will allude to in the new, that is the CSA Constitution, provides that the cabinet ministers and heads of the departments may have the privilege of seats. I mean, this is trivial stuff. This is not important stuff. He's, he ran out of the important stuff, and now he's into the trivial stuff. He's talked about changes in the Constitution that were favorable amongst the Southerners that were, you know, could not be achieved in, 18, in 1787 uh, with the other states. Now, <clears throat> Here's, here's the part that all the textbooks focus on. And this is way down deep in the thing. The guy has been talking for about an hour. He's run out of things to say. And so as he says, our new government is founded on exactly the opposite idea. In other words, we're not, we're not going into the idea that all men are created equal. The new idea, this comes direct. This is, this is 1861. This is like two years after Darwin's book. The great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery insubordinate of, to the superior race, <clears throat> is his natural and normal condition. Now, if you read Darwin, and, and Darwin's ideas had been percolating through the intelligentsia of the United States, that was the Darwin was the great truth. He uses the same terminology, the superior race subordination to the severe race. And so he has been misled by Darwin to think that black Americans, that is to say Africans, are not the equal of white Americans. So it's not, this is not a unique idea that came up in the South. This was a widely held idea. It was a scientific falsehood it was a pseudoscience idea that black people are, in, are inferior to white people. It was widely held by all Europeans 
and by Asians and other folks that this was true. Now, <clears throat> part B, I'm going to talk about it later. I'll start the, the, the next section here at part B, talking about what happened after this point. <clears throat> 